So it's uh, there's an advantage to knowing what I'm going to talk about when I'm picking out songs today. So you'll notice a theme in a lot of these songs we did. Uh, we did, He Has Made Me Glad, that started with, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in, his heart, in my heart, and I will enter his courts with praise. We did Psalms 100, that starts with, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. And later on it says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. We did a song called Give Thanks to the Lord that's taken from Psalm 107 that says, Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. We did a song called Give Thanks. It says, Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son. And then we did a song. I'm going to skip over that one for a minute. And we did How Good It Is. That says, How good it is to give thanks unto the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to his name. For he heals the brokenhearted, binding up their wounds. It is good to bless his holy name. And then Amber did a song called You Are Holy that it starts out when times are good I will worship you but in hard times I will worship too for you are great and you are greatly to be praised when skies are blue I will praise your name but when storms roll in I will praise you just the same for you are great greatly to be praised in victory I will give you thanks and in defeat I'll walk by faith for you are great and greatly to be praised when I feel joy I will glorify but when sorrow comes I'll still lift your name on high for you are great and you are greatly to be praised so what I want to talk about today is in everything give thanks and um, the very last thing I have printed on page 2 is a verse that I'm going to mention often it's 1 Thessalonians 5.18 And it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So, you know, when when my dad is up here every week, uh, it's it's easy for him to to jump into studying a book because he's going to be up here every week and he has time to go through the whole book. But when you're only up here every now and then, like I am, I have to come up with topics to talk about. So they always say, you know, you should talk about what you know, what you love. Um, I'm not up here very much, but a couple sermons ago that I did, I talked about, I used worship and worship songs as a topic. That's obviously something I know about and do often. Last time I talked, I used... Uh, astronomy as a topic I can be a little bit of a space nerd so I talked about the size and the vastness of the universe that God created and the fact that he's bigger than all of it well this time I'm going to use for some examples history because I'm I'm a space nerd but I'm probably even a bigger history nerd so Thanksgiving is in what 10 11 days something like 11 days I think so let's talk about the history of Thanksgiving for a few minutes okay the brief background it obviously goes pretty deep but we're going to keep it short as far as this goes in the dark ages or some people call it the middle ages uh, medieval times uh, it lasted from roughly 500 8500 to roughly 8500 so about a thousand years the catholic church was not only the primary religion but they had a whole lot of control over governments too Um, and 
England was very much included in that. Even though there was a king or a queen of England during all this time, or once England was established, the king or queen um, would give a whole lot of attention to whatever the Pope said, because they believed that if you went against the Pope, you couldn't get into heaven. So even though the king was, or the queen was the ultimate authority over England, the Pope had a whole lot of control over the king. Well, then comes King Henry VIII, who's a distant relative of Amber, by the way. Um, King Henry VIII had uh, he had a wife that was not giving him children, was not able to have children, and it was very important for the kings to have children at this point because that's how their family kept the kingdom. And uh, instead of being sympathetic toward his wife, King Henry VIII wanted to get rid of his wife, so he wanted a divorce. <laughs> But the problem with that is the Pope would not let him have a divorce. So Henry had to either accept the fact that he couldn't have kids or he had to go against the Pope and risk not going to heaven. So Henry decided to uh, separate from the church from the Catholic Church and they formed the the Church of England which was also known as uh, the Anglican Church so you that's a that's a backstory here to get to our main point you had you had England as a country separating from the church well you already had people in England not feeling that the Catholic Church was was the right path to the will of God. Now you had another state church in the Anglican Church coming about that these people didn't really feel like was any better. The the people you you will know them as the Pilgrims. They were called the Separatists at the time in England because they wanted to separate from the church. So these people were trying to create a new a new church for, for themselves to worship God in the way that they felt God wanted them to worship but when there was a state church in England the state church didn't like that and the, the pilgrims or the separatists were persecuted by the church which also meant they were being persecuted by the throne which was obviously very dangerous for them you can, you can lose your life by going against the king. So th in around 1600, early 1600s, they decided they wanted to leave England for religious freedom. Uh, at first they went to the Netherlands, but they ran into a whole lot of other problems there. Um, and it didn't take long before they realized that wasn't right for them either. So in 1620... They got aboard the Mayflower, which I'm sure you've all heard of, of the Mayflower. They they set sail in September of 1620, and in November they landed on what they called Plymouth Rock. Um, there were 102 of them on board, 102 passengers, but they landed in this new place in November. That's a problem if you got to grow your own food. Even if you have to hunt your own food, food becomes very scarce. So through that first winter, they went from 104 people to 44 people. They lost around two-thirds of their people. Obviously, this was very hard times for them. They were doing this. They were setting out to create a new colony because they wanted to worship God in the way that they felt he wanted to be worshipped. But in their very first winter in this new colony, they lost two-thirds of their people. 
fortunately, in 1621, they established a relationship with uh, some local native tribes. In particular, there was a native named Squanto <laughs> that had a... I don't know if I'm doing that or not. That had previously been taken captive to England uh, in the decades before. So he understood some English, so he was able to communicate between the natives and the, the pilgrims. And he helped them learn how to plant crops, um, learn how to fertilize the crops. And in 1621, they had a pretty successful harvest. So these pilgrims got together with these natives for a, a large three-day feast to give thanks for surviving and to give thanks to God for providing a way for them to be able to live in the new world. Even though times were still hard, they weren't, they weren't out of the woods, so to speak, just yet. They, they had a few tough years following this, but God had gotten them through, and they wanted to give thanks to God for it. Even though times were tough, they praised God because God was good. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So let's fast forward a couple hundred years to 19, or 1863. 1863 is right smack in the middle of the Civil War. Uh, the Civil War was a, obviously a very rough period for the United States of America. It had split temporarily into two countries, the United States of America and the Confederate States of America. And this had been a very costly war for America uh, with lives more than anything. Of all the wars, the huge wars that America has been a part of, uh, more American lives were lost in the Civil War than any of them. So, 1863, right smack in the middle of the war, um, the Union had been not doing so well in the war, the, the North. But they had two pretty decisive victories um, in Vicksburg and Gettysburg during this time. But there was still a long ways to go before the war was finished. But during this time, in 1863, that's when Abraham Lincoln gave the first very first Thanksgiving proclamation. He reminded the American people that despite the war was raging, America had a lot to be grateful for. The colonies were expanding, the population was growing, and they had, in his words, fruitful fields and healthy skies. Writing that the, many, the nation's many blessings should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged by the American people Lincoln declared, I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to be set apart and observe the last Thursday of November as next as the day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficial Father who dwelleth in the heavens. So the President of the United States in the middle of a civil war between the United States decided that no matter how bad things might seem, there was always something to be grateful for. And in the middle of this war is when he declared the first Thanksgiving to be uh, set aside as a national holiday. Okay, if you flip it over... Let's look at a couple examples from the Bible now. The book of Habakkuk, which I have to admit, I did not know a whole lot of the history of Habakkuk before I started putting this together. It's uh, 
one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament, and it's just not, it's just not one of the the major stories that you hear about a lot. But what was going on at this time is um, the kingdom of Judah. Uh, Israel had been separated into two countries, Judah and Israel. And the king of Judah at this time was, his name was, uh, I'm going to say it wrong anyway, but I'm trying to find it on my sheet, Jehoiakim. And he had led the people of Judah away from God and into idolatry. Because of this, God was preparing to judge the nation. Babylon, at that point, was uh, was basically conquering the world, and they were coming for, for Judah next. They were forming one of their world empires. In Habakkuk, who was a prophet of God, he had a hard time understanding why God would use a heathen nation like Babylon to bring judgment on his own people. And uh, God basically reminded him that God knew what he was doing. Even, even if it seems confusing to us, in this case, Habakkuk, he, he knew what he was doing. And in chapter 2 and verse 4, um, that's the first time we see the phrase that the just shall live by faith. That was God reminding Habakkuk that his people need to trust him. Ultimately, Habakkuk realized that God was right. Even if Habakkuk didn't understand what was going on, he needed to put his trust in God no matter what the circumstances look like. So chapter 3 of Habakkuk, verse 16 and 17, I have it printed here. It says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Let, let me read that again. Because things sound pretty bleak here, right? Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes in the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord and will be joyful in God my Savior. First Thessalonians 5.18 In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. How about Daniel? We all know this story, right? The background is um, the king at the time I'm pretty sure this was the Medes and the Persians the king was Darius and Daniel, um, the the Israelites had been conquered, but Daniel had gained favor with the king through some interpretation of dreams and some prophecies. He had gained favor with the king. And the king actually put Daniel in charge. Um, there were, the king was separating his kingdom into different regions and he was going to put various people in charge of each of these regions and even though Daniel was from one of the conquered countries he was going to put Daniel in charge of a large group of his people well people that were loyal other people that were loyal to Darius didn't really like this idea they were jealous of Daniel so they came up with a scheme they they got Darius um, th this seemed to happen several times in the Old Testament the, the people convinced the king through the king's own vanity that Darius should sign a decree that said that for 30 days no one could give praise or thanks to any 
God or any anybody other than Darius himself. Well, the people that got King Darius to sign this knew Daniel and knew that Daniel was a servant of God, knew that Daniel would pray. And the penalty for breaking this decree was to be thrown in a lion's den. Daniel heard that this had been signed and when he heard it it says he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime meaning Daniel knew that bad things were about to happen very bad things I mean being thrown in a lion's den is pretty extreme I'd say and it didn't matter he knew that God deserved his praise and God deserved his thanks no matter what was going on. So three times a day, he kept up his own habits and his own traditions and he kneeled and prayed and gave thanks to God no matter what was going on. Because in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Then we go forward to Paul and Silas. You guys have probably heard this story plenty of times, too. Paul and Silas were thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. Uh, during the Romans' rule, the emperor was God, basically. Um, if anyone was going to be worshipped, it was going to be the emperor, and only the emperor, or Caesar, as he was known. And preaching about any other god was punishable by prison or death but that didn't stop Paul and Silas they they were preaching the gospel they got caught by Roman soldiers they got thrown in jail they were put uh, their their legs and their arms were put in chains but in the middle of the night instead of talking about how rough life was and sitting around and, and feeling sorry for themselves they decided to sing and praise and give thanks so um, even though life was bad even though things weren't going exactly the way that they would have hoped Paul and Silas gave thanks because in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you another time Paul was in prison in Rome when he wrote to the Ephesians Paul went to prison a lot <laughs> that's, that's a common theme when you're reading about Paul but while he was in prison in Rome, he wrote a letter to the Ephesians, which he said, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that sound like a guy who is in prison? But, but even though things were going terribly for him in the world... He knew that in everything we should give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So, in fact, Paul was the one that later wrote this to the Thessalonians. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So that brings us to us now. It seems, if you look around it seems like life can be pretty tough. I mean, each of us in our daily lives, I, I complain about things that, that in my world seem tough. I'm, I'm sure you could all point to things that in your world seem tough and overwhelming. And we forget sometimes that in everything we should give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. When we look at the news, 
it's it's depressing. Um, people are getting shot all over the place for no reason. You have fires burning up big chunks of California, people losing their homes. There are a lot of terrible things going on in this world. But we serve a God who is greater than the terrible things. And Paul said in Romans, Romans 8, that the things of this present world can't compare to the things that are coming. And that is the reason we should give, be giving thanks in everything because we need to remember that no matter what happens in this world, we have better things coming. No matter how many times we have to read about terrible tragedies in the news, we have better things coming. No matter how many times things in our own lives get us down, we have better things coming. No matter how many times life just feels overwhelming, we have better things coming. And that's why in everything we should give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So in 11 days, we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving. And as a national holiday, it is a time to give thanks for our freedom and our, our ability to serve God how we choose. And it's a time to give thanks for, for the things we have. But it's also a time that we should remember to give thanks for the things that we know are coming. Because in everything we should give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us.